Dr. Sage here. In this video, we're going to discuss the internal structures of the bacteria. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify five structures that may be contained in the bacterial cytoplasm and detail the causes and mechanisms of sporulation and germination. The cytoplasm is a prominent site for the cell's biochemical and synthetic activities. It's a gelatinous solution contained by the cytoplasmic membrane. It's between 70 and 80% water, and it's a complex mixture of sugars, amino acids, and salts. Located within the bacterial cell, you'll find the bacterial chromosome, which is a single circular strand of DNA. Note that it's not inside the nucleus like you would find it in a eukaryotic cell because bacteria don't have any membrane-bound organelles. Instead, it's in a region of the cell called the nucleoid. The DNA is tightly coiled around basic protein molecules to enable it to fit within the cell compartment. In addition to the DNA of the chromosome, you can also find in some bacteria plasmids. Plasmids are non-essential pieces of DNA. They are separate double-stranded circles of DNA. They're duplicated and passed on to offspring during replication. They can confer protective traits and they're an important agent in genetic engineering. Bacteria have ribosomes, just like eukaryotes have ribosomes. The bacterial ribosomes are made up of rRNA, ribosome RNA, and proteins. They're dispersed throughout the cytoplasm, and you often find them in chains. Now, they are distinct from the eukaryotic ribosomes. So prokaryotic ribosomes and eukaryotic ribosomes are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. One way of measuring the size of a cell component is called a Svedberg unit. It's a relative size of the cell parts through sedimentation during centrifugation. Okay, so through this process, we can see that the bacterial ribosomes are 70 Svedbergs, whereas eukaryotic ribosomes are 80. Bacteria can also have inclusion bodies, which can be storage sites for nutrients during periods of abundance, and they can vary in their size, number, and content. Bacteria have a cytoskeleton. Now, eukaryotes have a cytoskeleton, but the bacteriocytic skeleton is made out of different types of components. The bacteriocytic skeleton is long polymers of proteins, which are similar to the actin proteins in eukaryotic cells. They can be arranged in helical ribbons around the cell, just under the cytoplasmic membrane. They can contribute to the cell's shape, and they're a potential target for antibiotic development, since the bacteria have these particular proteins and eukaryotic cells do not. Now, when exposed to environmental stress, the bacteria can develop a thick wall around their genome and a small portion of the cytoplasm. This is called an endospore. This allows them to survive extreme conditions. So it makes them highly resistant to environmental stress, such as heat, drying, freezing, radiation, and chemicals. The endospore is metabolically inactive, but it's viable. It can be dormant, sometimes for centuries. And then when conditions improve, it can germinate and return to normal cell division. So bacteria can undergo a two-phase life cycle. The vegetative cell, which is a metabolically active cell, and the endospore, which is inert and it's in a resting condition. Sporulation is spore formation induced by environmental conditions. So bacteria might undergo sporulation when there's some stimulus to induce it to start sporulation, such as the depletion of nutrients, especially carbon and nitrogen sources. The sporangium is a sporulating cell, and transformation takes between six to eight hours in most species. So in order to undergo sporulation, what's gonna happen is the bacteria is going to replicate its DNA, and then it will form a membrane around this DNA. The fourth spore then forms additional membranes, a protective cortex forms around the spore, a protein coat then forms around the cortex, and the spore is released. So this is a metabolically inactive but viable endospore. When you have an endospore, it can then undergo germination. Germination begins when favorable conditions arise, such as exposure to water and a germination agent. The germination agent stimulates the formation of hydrolytic enzymes that break down the cortex of the endospore. The core rehydrates and takes up nutrients, and the bacterium grows out of the endospore coats. Once initiated, germination proceeds to completion in about one and a half hours. Now, there are some human diseases that are related to spore persistence. 
For example, anthrax, tetanus or lockjaw, gangrene, and botulism. Endospores are consistent intruders where sterility and cleanliness are important. They're resistant to ordinary cleaning methods. So boiling water, soaps, and disinfectants might not get rid of endospores. They frequently contaminate cultures and media, and hospitals must protect against endospores and wounds. Destruction of endospores are important in the food canning industry. So that was your brief introduction to the internal structures of bacteria. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.